In Frank Baum's uh, classic novel, The Wizard of Oz, uh, Dorothy Gale uh, was stuck in a land that was very far from her home. One minute, she's, uh, she encounters a tornado in Kansas, and then in the next minute, she is in, uh, she's walking out of her house into a land of color, a land with very strange creatures, witches who are both good and evil, trees that can talk, monkeys that can fly. And with everything that she experiences, she is continually reminded again and again and again that she is far from home and that she is willing to do anything uh, that she needs to do in order to get back to her family in Kansas. And after everything that she has gone through, Glenda the Good Witch tells her that really all she needs to do is click the heels of her ruby slippers together and repeat the mantra, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And that's a true statement. There really is no place like home. Julie and I, have, uh, we both grew up in Minnesota, uh, but since we've been married, we've lived in two other states. Uh, we lived in Kentucky for three years while I attended seminary, and uh, then we lived in Nebraska for almost uh, four years uh, when I pastored a church that was just outside of Omaha. And while those were great experiences, and we would never trade any of those experiences for anything, uh, we met some incredible people, and we saw the Lord do some incredible things there. There was always this abiding sense that in those seven years that, that something just wasn't right. We loved the communities that we were a part of, but it just never really felt like home. It seemed like we were always clicking our heels together and saying that there's no place like home. And so when the position of associate pastor opened up here at Emmanuel, and I was offered the, the, the job, uh, I, it just felt right. It didn't seem like we had to get used to much at all. Uh, it, it felt like coming home after being gone for so long. And many of you have, have felt that, that sort of way too. Maybe you've lived in a different state. Uh, or maybe you've lived in a different country and it just never really felt quite right. Uh, maybe you've been on a long vacation that was great, but there's just nothing like your own bed. Maybe you have been on a short vacation that was a complete disaster and you knew that there was no place like home, and you just wanted to get back. You know, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, there should be a sense to all of us that, uh, to one degree or another, that something isn't right, that we are far from home, that we don't belong here. And it's because God has put eternity into our hearts. This world is a temporary stay. The Apostle Peter actually calls us uh, sojourners and exiles, which means that this isn't a permanent stay. Our home is somewhere else. We belong in heaven. And in Philippians chapter 3, uh, the Apostle uh, Paul said that our citizenship is in heaven, and from heaven we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's with that in mind now that we turn to our final message in Genesis. Jacob and his family have left the land of promise, the land of Canaan, the one that was promised uh, to Abraham in order to sojourn in the land of Egypt, uh, to be with their long lost brother and son Joseph, to be able to survive because of a massive worldwide famine. And Egypt had provisions. But even though they are a family again, and that it, 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 they're healing from their wounds that they had caused each other. It is obvious that Egypt was not their home. They didn't belong there. They belonged in the land that God had promised them uh, to their ancestor Abraham. And if you are uh, united to Christ in his life, in his death, in his, in his resurrection, and his ascension, then you are in Egypt right now too. 
We are far from our true home, but through Christ, we have a foretaste of what those blessings of Christ are and the expansion of his kingdom here and now. So let's break those things down in two ways. The first thing that we need to see today is that we ought to receive the blessings of Christ. We ought to receive the blessings of Christ. It sounds paradoxical, but the idea of a blessing is sort of a, uh, a foreign familiarity to us. There's a sense in, in, in which we throw around the word blessing a lot. We say things like, man, it's really a blessing that that happened to me today. Uh, or you're such a blessing to me. Or we might say a blessing before uh, we engage in a meal together. And it usually points towards something positive. Uh, when something good happens, it's a blessing. And to a certain extent, that's true. We've seen that in, in Genesis when God promised Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and to him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We can rightly conclude that God is saying that he will treat favorably those who treat Abraham and his family favorably. But there's another sense in which a blessing is completely foreign to us. And we see it all over Genesis. When a patriarch is dying, it is, it is uh, typical of him uh, to give his children a blessing. But as we have seen, it's not always something that, that indicates something positive is going to happen. Instead, it's more of a prophetic utterance of what this child or his offspring are going to be like. When Jacob stole the birthright from his brother Esau, uh, Isaac, their father, blessed Jacob positively. Look what it says in chapter 27. May God give you of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. So the Abrahamic promise now given to, uh, to Jacob and that sounds pretty good, right? Now to the blessing that he gives Esau. Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, but when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. And so now in, in, in chapters 48 and 49, uh, they are completely dominated by blessings. Jacob is, is dying. He is in his last days, and because of that, the, the occasion calls for him to, to bless his children. Now, in chapter 48, uh, it deals specifically with the spiritual adoption of Joseph's children, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, and Jacob then considers Joseph's sons as his own, and as such, they will inherit the promises of God uh, just as uh, Joseph's brothers would. And the strange thing about this blessing is that Jacob blesses the younger Ephraim as the firstborn. And Jacob doesn't like that because Manasseh was the firstborn. This is completely countercultural to what is expected should happen. But the irony of this is that Jacob was the younger and Esau was the older. But whereas uh, Jacob received the blessing through deceptive means. Ephraim here is getting it completely by legitimate means. And from there, verse, uh, 40, chapter 49 tells us that Jacob, he, he calls all of his sons together to bless them. This means his time is coming, it's, it, and it gets awkward very, very quick. And it's sort of a history lesson as far as to what Jacob's children uh, were like. In verse 3, he begins with Reuben, the firstborn. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the firstfruits of my strength. 
preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. And so far, so good again, right? Verse 4, unstable as water. Can you imagine your father telling you this? You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. When you think, well, what is that all about? Jacob's reminding the, the rest of the brothers and as well as Reuben of the time in which Reuben decided to do a power play against his father by sleeping with his stepmother. And from that, he disqualified himself from being the firstborn. He moves on to Simeon and Levi in verse 5. Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul not come into their counsel. O oh, my glory, be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. You might remember uh, Levi and Simeon as the two who went and slaughtered an entire community. The men, women, and children in retaliation for a rape of their sister Dinah. Now was justice uh, was justice called for at that time? Absolutely. But certainly not genocide. And he goes on from there. They aren't all bad. He talks about Zebulun and how Zebulun will acquire land on the coast of Canaan and Dan and Gad will be fierce warriors which will come in, come in handy when they, they try to go into the land of Canaan and, and overtake it. Some of these are just strange. He, he says that Asher's tribe is going to be really good at food, so apparently they're the food network people of the family. Uh, Nephtali's tribe appears to produce beautiful people, so here are the models of, of uh, Israel. The tribe of Benjamin will be shrewd, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if there was a highlight reel on all of these blessings, it would center on Judah. Because now in Jacob's mind, it is Judah who has taken the place of the firstborn in his family. And this is strange to us because Judah was the one that had the idea to sell Joseph into slavery in the first place. He is the one who produced children with his daughter-in-law because he thought she was a prostitute. But we've also seen in the past few weeks how Judah's really grown up here. Something clicked and he has became the leader and the compass of the family. And so it is that Jacob pronounces the blessings on Judah in verses 8 through 10. Judah, your brother shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He swooped down. He crouched as a lion. And as a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So in all of his children now that is, uh, that is attributed to Jacob, it is Judah that arises in preeminence, that arises as the one that is going to sort of be the star of the show as, as the story goes forward. All other tribes will bow down to him. Everything that Jacob has said here points to royalty. He will be victorious over Israel's enemies. He will be king over, over all. And uh, his descendant, from his descendants, kings will come. And one day, the true king of Judah, the obedience of the nations will come. And this is indeed exactly what happened. When the time came and Israel demanded a king, it was David who eventually would rise to the throne of Israel and would be the, uh, the model king by which all kings would be compared. 
Yes, he had flaws, but in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, the Lord reiterated his promise to Judah and extended it even more by saying, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And Matthew in his gospel then retraces this line to make the point that this forever king that would come from Judah and come from David was Jesus Christ our Lord. So all the generations from Abraham to David, 14, from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. And now this is where you and I come into the story. And this is where it gets good. The Bible tells us that when we trust in Christ, we receive adoption as sons and daughters of the living God. And because of that, we inherit all of the blessings and inheritances that are Christ's. In Ephesians chapter 2, it tells us, that, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And John chapter 1 verse 12 tells us, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And then 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And friends, why is this good news? It is good news because when we come to Christ in faith, the blessings that we receive are not negative blessings like Reuben or like Simeon or like Levi. We don't get left out or we don't get cut out of the will because of our sins and mistakes. Whatever we've done, whatever we've thought, whatever we have have said from the most petty to the most heinous and disgusting is forgiven. In Christ, Psalm 32 is ours. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. And in spite of everything that we have done in Christ, we can confidently say with Paul from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Friends, we aren't home yet. With every day that passes, we are reminded of that truth. But our days of sojourning can be more bearable when we take an inventory the fact that we're included in the family of God. Not because of our merits, but because of Christ. Secondly, we need to return to Eden. Return to Eden. And it's here we come full circle of this entire book. When you take the book ends of Genesis and you compare them, it causes concern. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 tells us, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as you make your way through chapter 1, you see a picture of God creating everything. Every bit of matter that exists in our entire universe was created by the creative power of God's word. And once God had created the perfect environment, he finished his creation off by creating humans. 
in his very image. And the last verse of chapter 1 says, And God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. Contrast that with the very last verse of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 50. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin. That's it. That's how it ends. Do you see the discord? It starts with perfection, and it ends with a body in a box. And while this may be depressing and reeks of reality, it is both looking forward, it is both looking back and pointing forward. The Garden of Eden, it's long gone. Adam and Eve were shut out because of their sin, but in the midst of their judgment, they received from the Lord hope. God was going to one day restore Eden through the promised seed of Eve. In other words, there's coming a day when a descendant that's coming from Adam and Eve that is going to crush the head of the serpent that met them in the garden and undid everything and made it the way that it is today. And will restore us to a place of perfection in which God's people would dwell with him in perfection. So throughout Genesis, we are continually asking the question, is this him? Is this the one that is to come and restore all things? And story after story, and sin after sin, and death after death, we still yet see forward movement. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7 says, The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. In verse 3, God promises Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families shall be blessed. So while the earth was expanding in population, God was narrowing his focus to one person and said, I am going to start recreating Eden through your offspring. You're not the promised seed, but he is going to come from you. And so then the whole story of Genesis is a story of protecting the seed and preparing for the land. And through it all, the grace and the sovereignty of God superintends it. When you look at the cast of characters that we have encountered through this, this journey, there's no way that any of us could believe that this would be the people that God would use. Abraham was a coward who threw his wife under the bus twice. Isaac blatantly favored one child over another. Jacob was a liar, a cheat, a thief, a manipulator. And among his children were people who practiced incest, who were murderers, human traffickers, and more. But yet here we are at the end of Genesis and we see that the seed has been preserved. The promised one will come. On the other hand, this idea of land dominates these chapters. Jacob is, is far from home, and he's drawing his last breath, and yet he cannot, he cannot even imagine being left and buried in Egypt. Look at chapter 49, verse 29. I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephron, the Hittite, to possess as a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife, 
There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. So Jacob would, he, his desire was that his remains would be in the place that Abraham purchased as a foretaste of acquiring all of the land that God promised to him. It is a land that is a perfect environment for, uh, for agriculture and growth and for God's people to expand God's kingdom. And Joseph, even though he had spent almost 20 years as Pharaoh's uh, vice regent, understood this. As Joseph now lay dying in chapter 50, he said this to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. And this would happen, but not for another 400 years or so. When the Israelites left Egypt from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, Exodus chapter 13 tells us this, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. So the Israelites would eventually conquer the land of Canaan, only to destroy the land by perverting justice and engaging in idolatry. Prophets wouldn't win them back to God. Priests would, lay, uh, would, would lead them astray. Kings would, would engage them in idolatry. There needed, the land needed the promised seed of Eve. And then in one quiet night, in the land of Judah, in the town of Bethlehem, a baby was born. The seed of Eve had, had come as the son of God, Jesus of Nazareth. And this Jesus would come and say, you know what? I am not concerned about the physical land in which I stand. I am concerned about the real estate in your heart. Your heart has been taken captive of the things of this, of this world, and I am here to reclaim your heart and occupy all of its space. And so what Jesus does then is he tills the soil of our hearts and he plants his word. He plants his truth and his spirit in, in us, and they take residence in us when we come to the point that we realize that we have been living for the glory of ourselves. We have traded the space in our hearts that are meant specifically for the Lord and replaced them with things like power and greed and sexual immorality and popularity and a good reputation, things that, things that may be good in, in and of themselves, but we have placed them on the throne of our hearts. And so when we come to the point where we can see that this is true about me, and this is true about you, and we turn from them, and we turn to Jesus in faith. He makes our hearts new, and he reclaims the land of our hearts for, our, for himself. And when this happens, you begin to feel that you are far from home. The way that the world operates and the direction that is going, you have this abiding sense that there's, there's got to be something more. C.S. Lewis famously said in Mere Christianity, he said, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. Eternity is in our hearts, friends. We were made for Eden. 
and Eden is coming. In Revelation chapter 21, John writes of his vision. He said, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night, no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Friends in Christ, this is our home. This is our dream home. Jesus said for that those uh, of us who are in him, the land of Israel is not the promise, but the entire world one day. And our job now as strangers and exiles is to tell the world that they're invited too. This house was created for them as well. There is hope and there is healing and there is forgiveness and there is grace because of the one who loved us and set us free from our sins. We invite people to the future Eden that is coming. Friends, we're far from home, but not for long. And until then, we have a job to do. But first, consider your heart. Is the property of your heart owned by Jesus or by something else that is captivating you? With everything that is promised to us in Christ, would you today consider giving your life to Christ or giving your life back to Christ it is time to come home come home to Jesus let's pray thank you for listening to this message from Emmanuel Baptist Church in Mora, Minnesota for more content be sure to subscribe if you like what you've heard consider partnering with us in our mission text the word GIVE to 320-313-1950.